Thank you, Pierre, for the kind introduction. Uh, tonight, we are excited to welcome Catherine Goldstein and Clémence Perronet for a conference on female role models and how they can or cannot contribute to improve gender equality in sciences. So we are particularly lucky to have some of them with us today. So we have um, Aline lefebvre le Pau, Nina Auter, Laure Quivy, and Thivo that are present with us in the room. Um, so what are they doing? Aline is working on mathematical models and algorithms simulating the behavior of granular media and viscous suspensions at Centrale Supélec. Nina is working at Orsay and she's interested in topological data analysis, while Laure is a specialist in scientific computing and director of the mathematics department at ENS Paris-Saclay. And finally, T is working at NCA in Evry and is interested in applying mathematics to bi biology and ecology. So uh, being a woman in STEM has faced me with some challenges. As we all know, especially in mathematics, there are not a lot of women. Women are a minority. Um, therefore, it hasn't always been easy for me to project myself as a mathematician. Uh, that's why I think that today's event by Just Do Math is crucial for future mathematicians and for future generation of mathematicians. Role models show that there is a path and a place for female mathematicians. I'm particularly thankful for the guidance of Susanna Zimmerman, uh, a great mathematician and an even greater inspiration. Every year she organizes a masterclass for M1 students uh, with a particular condition the participants have to be at least 50% women. Um, so I, had, I experienced this masterclass last year and um, it inspired me and um, uh, introduced me to a lot of talented mathematicians uh, who had a shared vision and experience of mathematics. Uh, so now a few words about today's speakers, tonight's speakers. So Catherine Goldstein is a mathematician and historian of mathematics at Institut de Mathematiques de Jussieu Paris Rive Gauche, who, before moving to Paris, spent more than 20 years at Orsay. Clémence Perronet is a sociologist with a particular interest in sociology of scientific knowledge, sociology of culture, and the sociology of gender. She works at the Centre Max Weber. Alongside Claire Marc and Olga Paris Romaskevich, Clémence has just published a book on gender equity in mathematics, for which Catherine has written the preface. Note that the book will be available at the end of the conference for purchase. We want this conference to be interactive, so please don't shy to answer to Catherine and Clémence's questions. As there are people with us online, it is important that you speak clearly and loudly. The same will be true for the Q&A section the Q&A session at the end of the conference. Um, as some people have a shuttle bus uh, to, to catch, to get back home after this event, keeping the clock is crucial. So I will remind you about five minutes before the end of your presentation. So this way we'll have enough time for the Q&A session with the audience. So this being said, I now give floor to Catherine and Clémence for their conference. Enjoy. So thank you very much, Audrey. Uh, thank you all for coming. So in fact, the main talk will be the talk by Clémence, and I will just provide an introduction, uh, essentially uh, to explain a bit to you the surge, if one of my colleague, uh, dearest colleague, uh, <laughs> can stop speaking, um, the surge of interest and concern in the question of women in mathematics. And I must say that uh, for me, who uh, knew this institute uh, in the last century, uh, in the 90s, 80s and 90s, 1980s and 1990s, it is very strange uh, to listen and to hear about uh, such an event in this building. It was really a a uh, high place for uh, misogynous uh, uh, people uh, in, at that time. So, But now it's no more the case, so I'm very happy. So let me begin by some data. So the data are uh, 
Uh, the data about the women mathematician, professional mathematician in mathematical academia in France. So, as you see, uh, in general, there is about 22% of women uh, in the mathematical academia. But uh, there are a lot of differences. So, here you have uh, the data for uh, pure mathematics, applied mathematics. I put the computer science just uh, as a reminder of the difference with some other fields nearby, and also the situation in the CNRS. And it's already interesting because you see a lot of differences uh, between, uh, for instance, what happens in pure mathematics. The percentage of full professor women in mathematics is very low. And one of uh, our colleagues, Christian Castle, spoke uh, some years ago of an endangered species. In fact, the number of full professors in pure mathematics, the women, uh, will disappear in 2050 uh, with this uh, decrease. Uh, in the last years. And the situation is much better in applied mathematics, but again, there is what is called a uh, glass ceiling between the number uh, of uh, researcher, um, associate professor, and the numbers uh, of um, full professor. So, uh, just to have a sort of international comparison, uh, it's a bit um, Early on, uh, so 2005, I don't have such a data for a more recent period, but you can see immediately the differences depending on the countries. And it was one of the first things which uh, struck us when we began to study this uh, sort of data a long time ago, is the difference among countries, which are very near or very close for their mathematical level sometimes, but are in fact very different. Uh, confronted to the situation of uh, women in academia. And I think it's a very good argument for people who still now explain that all this is a biological factors. Because I don't know really the difference, the biological difference between Portuguese, French or British women, I must say. But still, if you look at the data, it is very different in these different countries. Okay, you can see, for instance, in Switzerland, 6% but in Portugal, almost um, 50%. So uh, why is it so bizarre and uh, why does it launch a certain anxiety in French? It's because the situation in France, contrary to other countries, is stable. It is stable from the 90s to essentially now. Uh, there was uh, about 22% of women in the mathematical academia in the 90s, and it's the same now. And you can see that for the other country, it's not the same. There, there were a lot of, uh, uh, well, increase, uh, sometimes a lot, sometimes not, but an increase of the percentage of women mathematicians in other countries. Uh, in fact, just uh, another data uh, to confirm that the situation in France is really stable for a long time. It's uh, the number of women mathematicians in the CNRS. And you can see, uh, well, this is this blue line. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm not very, I will probably change this. I'm left-handed. Um, is it better? slightly. Uh, so it's really stable, while this is the number of men. And as you see, the situation is very different. So it is quite general, in fact, and it doesn't affect only uh, the mathematical ac academia. Uh, here, there's very recent data showing the difference uh, in several uh, countries in Europe uh, in the scientist and engineer population, the young one, so between 25 and 34 years old. And you can see uh, the difference between men and women and the difference between uh, 10 years ago and now. And you see that for France, well, the situation is not much better, while in some other country, uh, there are the increase, of course, uh, in the number, the percentage of, uh, of women, which is much, much more drastic. And in some case, uh, it has even be almost uh, the same as the percentage of, uh, of male. Okay, and just for the road, this thing, it is the same, in fact, and it is even worse for the population of the master students, which can interest some of you particularly. Uh, if we compare the percentage in the uh, last decade and now, you see here that, uh, oops, mathematics and only mathematics 
it's the, the field where the percentage of women decreased during this last decade, while in all other fields it has increased. Okay. So it's a very spectacular uh, data, I think. So, to summarize, uh, important national differences, important disciplinary differences, including inside mathematics, a certain glass ceiling, but that's very current, and especially no substantial progress made in France. And one factor which has been most discussed is that France is the country of the reforms. As you know, we have a reform in higher education or education every two years, and normally these reforms has, have an effect on the percentage of uh, women in mathematics, and normally it's a bad effect. And the last data, uh, this is of course very much commented uh, in the, the newspapers recently. Uh, we are back with the last reform of two years ago. We are back to the percentage of uh, women for uh, scientific baccalaureate we had in the 60s. Well, it was almost equality in 2020. So it's quite spectacular again. So what to do about that? I show you the solution uh, suggested by the CNRS in the program Integer, uh, a big program, international program, uh, where the CNRS participated uh, 10 years ago. And uh, they have proposed 14 priority axes and 37 measures from supporting gender study to supporting childcare costs for conferences or even work at home. Not sure it's a complete uh, good solution, but. Uh, and the red one here are the, the one were a bit implemented, for instance, uh, proposing a woman, more women for CNRS prizes and awards. And some, in particular in green, were not. Essentially, all those which uh, included money and recruitment. So among these uh, solutions, there is one which is uh, not very expensive, and it is uh, the fact that we have to develop feminine role models in mathematics. And this has been done at a large scale since uh, 10 years in particular. And so I would like to comment a bit the solutions uh, of the role models. Uh, Clémence will discuss that uh, in more detail in her talk. But I would just to, to give you uh, a few of my opinion about that. So here you have, for instance, uh, the first page of uh, a suggestion of the Max Planck Gesellschaft in Germany, which is called Female Scientist and Historical Trailblazer. Trailblazers, it means pioneer, pioneers. Huh? And uh, so the site proposed to present some portraits of women in science, historical, essentially, uh, women. And it's presented like that. Female science pioneers in history, we persevered despite facing off a daunting social obstacle. So I don't think it's very encouraging, in fact, but my opinion. So this is essentially this uh, idea of role model. Often there are historical role models. Uh, and I have a problem as a now historian of mathematics because the inner life, the daily life, the values of people are really very difficult to understand, uh, very difficult to document for historical figures. And uh, more or less to con and even more to convey to a contemporary public. So uh, the contemporary situation, the personal and collective uh, values we have now and the concrete needs we have, for instance, uh, the need for a work, for a career, are very different from this uh, historical situation. And very often the gaps uh, we have in the documentation or in the historical presentation of this uh, woman, they are filled by myths and stereotypes about women and about mathematics, what should be a woman. So you have a lot of, uh, of uh, issues, for instance, about was, uh, was she beautiful or not as a historical figure? Who cares? Uh, I never heard such a, a question about Poincaré. And, uh, uh, and about mathematics. Mathematics is for geniuses. It's a very difficult subject. It should uh, uh, remain sub uh, a difficult subject. So these women were particularly uh, very geniuses or even uh, worse than that. And so, uh, and essentially, uh, there are models of triumphs against obstacles, global success or global victimization. I just want you to give you one example. 
which is from a page of one of the university I depend on, Université Paris-Cité. It's a site called Women Forgotten from History, and they have Sophie Germain. And they say, for instance, at the end of the 18th century, it seems scandalous that a woman was studying science. Certainly not. What was the problem for Sophie Germain is to have access to the advanced courses at the Ecole Polytechnique, because the Ecole Polytechnique was a, a, a school training for careers and civil or military engineers. And of course, at the time, women can't be engineers uh, on the ground. So uh, the, the school was not open to women. Uh, she works in number theory and proved Fermat's great theorem. This is a scoop. So the, the Fermat last theorem was proved. In fact, it's a very important theorem in mathematics. Uh, dating back to the from the 17th century, it was proved in the 19th century, in the 20th century, sorry, 1994, by Andrew Wiles and a lot of uh, modern techniques. What uh, Sophie Germain proved was an interesting, a new theorem. Uh, a technical one, which is difficult to explain to a general audience uh, without uh, in, in two sentences, but a very professional, I would say, now theorem. And uh, for instance, on her death certificate, she is listed as a rentier, which in those days were more honorable for a woman than being listed as a mathematician. No, uh, oh, no issue of honorability, nobody. Uh, male or female, is uh, indicated as mathematician because it was not a career, it was not a profession. You, were, you could be a professor, for instance, at the university and paid for that. You could be housewife, which is uh, a status, but certainly no mathematician. Okay? So, in fact, if you look at the various uh, role models we have in the literature, they are all somehow uh, imaginary. Okay, and I don't see a lot of differences between uh, the imaginary portrait of Hypatia, who is supposed to be the first uh, genius in mathematics. We have absolutely no trace of her except uh, one line in an encyclopedia published uh, six centuries after its death, potential death. But we have a literature up to the ceiling about what she could have done, or she could have fought, or she could have uh, be through, and so on and so on. Or, uh, of course, a completely imaginary character like uh, Catherine Janeway, my favorite, in the Star Trek series, a captain and a scientist, of which we know a lot because it was created by. Uh, the um, writers of the series, or somebody we know really uh, some things, but not all, like Sophie Germain. And uh, as, uh, as I showed you, a lot of uh, websites or portraits of Sophie Germain are completely reconstructed with mythical elements uh, borrowed to uh, what the people think this woman could have thought or could have been through. So often presented as martyrs, victims, pioneers, geniuses, perfect, and so on. Uh, while the concrete life and uh, now the career conditions are very different from uh, this woman, uh, let be uh, uh, real or not, I don't think I can be a space captain uh, for the moment, So, uh, and I don't think you can be really. But uh, it could be attractive, perhaps, especially for younger persons, but not necessarily applicable or replicable. So just to finish with that, I would like to finish with a personal note of things which have been uh, important for me and uh, to support also the exhibit which is uh, in the other room. Uh, it is the fact that I don't think that one role model is so useful, but uh, testimonies and interviews of a lot of women mathematicians and especially uh, contemporary women mathematicians describing their views and their experiences, including not so good ones, were for me very useful to see the doubts, to see the problems, to see how they change uh, their minds about what mathematics should be done or with whom to work and so on. That was very concrete and that was very useful. And I can recommend you something from Orsay, Publication Mathematique d'Orsay. It's online and there are several, it's from 74. It gives you an idea about my age. And uh, it's still, I think, very relevant. And there is a, a testimony by Michel Vergne, which I liked uh, especially. She uh, spoke about this place in the 70s. Shit. Shit. <laughs>
Emmanuel, don't look at that. You know the text, I suppose. <laughs> and the other thing which was very important for me was to have a large variety of partial models. So there are some women in mathematics, which I'm, I met uh, in my career, and they are all very important, they're all very different, and the fact that they're all very different, uh, I was not identified with any of them, but that proved to me that there was a lot of possibility to become a researcher uh, with a lot of partial model, and that was for me more important than having one specific historical figure uh, to refer to. So it is essentially what is done in the in the hallway. So I, uh, but I think it's important that there are many uh, different uh, women in mathematics, and it means recruiting different women in mathematics too. And we will see if um, it is also something which is relevant uh, for younger persons. And so I will pass the floor to uh, Clémence to discuss. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm not sure how to switch presentations. To start, I wanted to say a few words uh, to explain the context of this presentation. Um, as was said, I'm a sociologist, and what I'm about to present to you are the results of a sociological studied study that I carried out, and that um, and I recently published the results in the book Matters, uh, and it means math girls, and so yeah, you have it now. Um, so. Everything I'm about to say is results from this study that was published in this book recently. And so today we are going to explore together, carrying on on what Catherine said, what role models can mean today for young girls, for teenage girls who are pretty interested in mathematics. So as a sociologist, have been interested in the issue of social inequalities before science for a while now. I've been exploring gender inequalities, but not only. I've also studied class inequalities and race inequalities. So uh, to put it simply, the way science and math are um, sexist, elitist and racist and how it structures um, the way we do science later on. But my last study was really focused on mathematics and on girls who still enjoy doing math at 16 years old. And as Catherine said, they just became the majority in France um, with the last uh, educational reform. So those girls, um, I, was, uh, I, I had the opportunity to... Oh, sorry. I, I missed the slides. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, carry the sociological study with those girls, with my colleague, sociologist Alice Pavi. We used pretty usual methods that we use in sociology. So we um, spent two weeks observing girls that were participating in a math camp organized by researchers in the south of France. Then we interviewed 45 girls individually Interviews lasted between 45 minutes and two hours. We talked about their families, what they experienced in schools, but also uh, their models and aspirations. We also carried a corpus analysis on the cover letters that the girls sent to get admitted into the, um, the math camp. And finally, we had some questionnaires at the end of, the, of their experience. But today, I'm mostly going to talk about what we discovered in the interviews. And just to give you uh, a few information on the, um, on the girls that we studied, a final word about them, most of them are from a pretty privileged background. Because when you um, invite girls to come to a math camp, uh, many of them who come are daughters of math teachers and engineers. So a lot of them are actually daughters of math teachers and engineers. But also some of them come from um, uh, less privileged and working class backgrounds. Role models. Let's dive in. In order to try and understand what was going on with these teenage girls, um, Alice Pavi, my colleague and I, we asked a pretty simple question, or so we thought. 
we asked the girls, are they any people real or fictional who inspire you or who you feel like you resemble or you feel some kind of connection of kinship with them and then are any of them connected to math or science? So it was kind of a two-part question. Who do you feel you look like? Who inspires you? And then any connection with math or science? And this is Lea. Lea really loved my question because she was already ready for it. I had no idea, but she had in her phone a list of 19 characters <laughs> that she felt looked like her and inspired her and where really she called them, it was kinship between her and the characters, all of them from mangas and animes. <laughs> a few of them, a few of them. Karma from Assassination Classroom. <laughs> Why? is very intelligent and ironic. Okaiwa from um, IQ, <coughs> he has the God complex. I'm better than everyone else. He needs to be on a winding streak. Nero from My Hero Academia is calm and intelligent. Eren from Aragon Titan, quite a manipulative character. And then uh, Gojo, the strongest, nonchalant, arrogant, unsympathetic and cruel. <laughs> So that was the who looks like you and who do you feel some kind of kinship with. <laughs> 19, that's only five, there were 19 of them. No girls. I noticed, but Lea noticed as well. And she said, it's so frustrating that there are no girls. I think that girls are less developed as characters than guys in those stories. Or the girls' characters that are developed are not like me at all. And this is a, a sentiment that many other girls shared with her. And they noticed that, yes, indeed, example of women that inspired them, especially when it came to science, math, and intelligence, were pretty hard to find. And there is another example that I really liked, another girl when asked, do you have any role model in science, any women role models in science? And she said, well, a female scientific role model, the only one I can think of is my, is my father, but he's not a woman. <laughs> so yeah, I don't think we, we have enough role models. This is, was to be expected when you know what, what girls have to face. The point, the starting point of this sociological study that we carried was that we think that it is indeed important and it is a key thing to have, uh, to have an availability of people that look like you and that you can see and identify yourself with in order to project yourself. And you can find them in many places. You can get models and inspirations from your real life, from people around you that you know. It can be your family, friends of the family. It can be professionals that you meet. You can also find role models in, um, can I, uh, I don't have the pointer, uh, in the media. They can be real people like celebrities of pu or public figures. What? Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> celebrities or public figures, you don't know them personally, but they do exist. And then the final tap type of role models are people that are completely fictionals, completely fictionals like all the, the, the characters from the anime and manga that we just talked about. But any, any kind of model can be useful to get this process of identification. And that is summed up in the, in, the, in the phrasing, you cannot be what you cannot see. And so there is an importance to see people that look like you and that you feel kinship with in all kinds of activities. But what we noticed with the girls is that they really do lack a female scientist as models. They don't have them in real life. And we've, sh we've seen with um, Catherine, because they don't, there are not enough women in science and in math in particular. So the consequence was that amongst the, the girls that we, we, survey, we surveyed, um, most of them, two thirds of them, had never met a female researcher before they came to the math camp where they got lucky and met uh, the only female mathematician of the team. And the only uh, scientist, female scientist that they knew were teachers. And that is good.
because these are both extremely useful and important. Um, issue is that what they valued, what they were interested in, in these female models that they knew and had met, was not their scientific value, was not even their cognitive value or their intelligence. They praised the women that they knew in scientific fields for the way that they cared about, for instance, their patients or their students. So they really praised them for their soft now, for communi communication skills, for development, for support, and not really for scientific skills. So two examples from that, what Ada said about her teachers. She said that uh, she's small like me, and even though she's small and the students make fun of her, she sticks to her job and does what she likes. I identify with her, and I want a student to identify with me in the future as well. And also what Gael said about the medical professional that she met was she, if she was in the hospital. Uh, my examples are the female doctors who operated on me. They were so nice and one even said to me, I've got a daughter uh, the same age as you. So you can see that she appreciated the caring part of the, of the medical professional. There are not enough examples of women scientists in the environment of girls and they cannot see them in the media because well, not everyone has a math teacher or a mathematician as a parent, but girls also lack role models in, uh, in the media. They tend to know very little about scientific celebrities or personalities uh, in general. So when you ask, do you know any a famous scientist, you get three answers, Einstein, Marie Curie, um, Pythagoras, then a blank, uh, and then uh, you know that guy in the movie, and four movies. The, the Theory of Everything, uh, that's um, the biopic of Stephen Hawking, the one, uh, the one here is the, um, in English, it's the, the Man Who Knew Infinity, which is a biopic about mathematician um, Ramanujan, the biopic about uh, Alan Turing, The Imitation Game, and then the most seen and the most famous movie among high school girls, um, Hidden Figures. The biopic I'm sure you've heard about, about um, the three uh, black scientists who helped in the, in the NASA, so Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Rogan, and Mary Jackson. But very few girls remember the names of all of those scientists, and again, especially for the women, they don't really remember the science part of uh, the movies or of the, of the careers. For instance, for Iron Figures, they mostly remember the part about the fight for civil rights and the fight against racism. And so they remember these women as being extremely brave in their, fa in their fight against racism and discriminations, but not really for what they did for the science uh, that, they, that they represented. So, a lack of examples in their environment, a lack of example in the media, and all of this is not surprising when you know about the history of science, and particularly, Catherine mentioned it also, the way that female uh, women, female scientists, have been actively erased from, um, from science history. <laughs> And I think this is important to note that they have been erased and not simply forgotten. And so I will, um, I will borrow the word of historian um, Margaret uh, Rositer. She's the one who coined the term Matilda effect. You may have heard about it. But today we often hear that the Matilda effect is the fact that women are forgotten. That's not what um, Rositer said as an historian she said was way stronger than that. She said that women's historically subordinate place in science was not a coincidence. It was not due to any lack of merit on their part, but it was due to the camouflage intentionally placed over their presence in science. So not forgotten, but actively hidden, actively erased from the book, from the archives, from the history that has been told about science. And that's why we lack examples. 
and I checked while the girls were doing the, the math camp, they were in a um, prestigious mathematical institution called the CIRM, the Center for International uh, Meetings in, in Mathematics. If they went to the library, which they did because they were excellent and very devoted students, there were many books about famous mathematicians, um, almost 90 books about male mathematician, and if you really looked, and I did, five about female mathematicians as a result of this, um, of this eraser and camouflage of them. So, women scientists have been erased from history, and today, the ones that are currently living are just ignored. So, girls cannot find role models, even if they look they have to look hard to find them in the media because today, just, just two figures concerning the, the French situation in the media, you have all, um, all activities taken together, 36% of airtime dedicated to women talking or doing things. And still uh, a huge part, 70% of experts that you can find on TV, on the radio, uh, or in s the scientific press, are still men. And this has been progressing very slowly, but we had a setback too uh, with the pandemic, and every time you have a crisis, it goes back to the, the previous numbers, and this, um, this kind of um, two-third, one-third rule when it comes to participation of women experts in the news. So, lack of role models in their close environment, but also in history and also in the contemporary media. This has very, we know that it has bad consequences for girls because we know that when they are provided with role models, it can really have a positive impact. And there is one study that is particularly interesting when it comes to this, a study that was carried by um, a few um, colleagues in economy, when they proved that even one visit from a female scientist in high school classrooms could have a positive effect on the representation and the aspirations of high school students. So they compared uh, what goes on in the classroom with the visit of a female scientist and with that. And a few things that they proved is that um, thanks to the visit, students are less likely to say things like men are better at science or men are more gifted when it comes to uh, math and science. They also noticed that when there is a visit from a female scientist, you have a little more girls that later on decide to continue their study in math and science, especially in preparatory, preparatory classes and in uh, uh, bachelors in math, physics and IT. So there is an impact of female role models, for instance, one woman going and talking to uh, a classroom of uh, high school boys and girls. But, but the study, the same study, also proved that it doesn't work all the time and it doesn't work for everyone. So it doesn't work all the time and it's really dependent on the person who goes and talks to the teenagers. But it also doesn't concern everyone and they showed that the effect is way stronger for girls if they are already very good students and when they come from a more privileged background. So it's more like the final push for girls who were on the verge and already pretty uh, likely to go into science, it doesn't have as much effect on, um, on girls who were less, were more um, uh, further away from going into this, um, these uh, studies. So this is, that's, that's what I, uh, I, I call the, the paradox of role models. And I wanted to find a few explanations as to why can it fail? Why can it have sometimes even counterproductive effects? And a few reasons why sometimes providing role models is not enough is because it can be a way to value individuals and individu individuality while forgetting or minimizing structural issues and especially gender-based uh, violence. So it, it can be a way to say, well, I did it, so it's possible and maybe it's not that hard. Another issue, obviously, um, is when 
you uh, show that women can come to science because they can have a complementary role and presence compared to men. So naturalizing the skills or the taste for science. Two examples of that uh, I got from the observation I mentioned earlier. So these are quotes from uh, female engineers who came and talked to the high school girls and try and encourage them to science, to come to uh, science studies and then engineering. One of them said, well, no one makes a difference between men and women today. We've always very well received. We know this is not true because we have studies about violence in the workplace. For instance, we know that one out of two female researchers um, are um, sexually harassed in the, worst in the workplace. So welcome, not so much. Another say that, well, it's women who don't make the effort to put themselves forward and that if you just assert yourself, then it's going to be fine. And another one said that, well, men and women have different qualities. We, as women, are supposed to have more intuition. And then she said that she was like the mother in her lab and in her workplace and that her male colleagues appreciated that from her. You can see how this is not good for encouraging women to take an equal place as men in science. Another issue with role models is when you give an example of a woman in science, but then you focus on the role that men played in her life, a career or a success. And we go back to Sophie Germain, we mentioned her earlier. This was the way she was uh, given as an example to the, the, the high school girls in, uh, during their math camp. So there was Sophie Germain, but then we talked a lot about three very famous men and the role they had in her life. Like Gauss, because he was the one who realized she was incredible. Or like Lagrange, because he wanted to meet her. So he deserves a mention because he realized she existed. Uh, <laughs> or Fourier, because he was the one who got her into the academy. This may be true, but we have so many narratives about women scientists where the, the attention is diverted from what they did and from their work to what men did and how the men helped her to become what she, what she could be. So this brings me to the, the last issue that we can have when we bring role models forward. It's also the fact that if you bring out models that are too exceptional, too incredible, too particular, well then you are just showing an exception that confirms the exclusion of everyone else. And so if you only uh, put out forward exceptional women such as Marie Curie or even such as Sophie Germain or Émilie du Châtelet, well then they can only be the exception because they are too far away for girls to imagine that they could become someone like that. And um, um, some of my historian colleagues, I think, put it very well because they say, no, we don't want, we refuse to replace the cult of heroes that there already is in science by the cult of heroines. And uh, they, they showed that these women, these heroines, they are often alibis, often ways to prove to gender wash the discourse in science. See, we talk about Sophie Germain. Well, then, are we done with the gender and math thing? All right, let's do real math now. This is also obviously an issue. The last subject I wanted to, uh, to talk to you about today is fiction. Because, well, I think we, we've proved that um, girls can have a hard time finding models in their real life and in the media and uh, as historical figures. So what about fiction? Better? No. Sadly, fiction where everything could be possible, everything should be possible, doesn't provide much more models when it comes to science. In the imaginary world as well, women are the minority. I've got colleagues who proved that, for instance, in children's books, you have um, twice as many male heroes as you have heroines. So the fictional humanity is, is even less equal than the, the um, the real hum uh, humanity. And this has consequences, because going back to my girls and the first question, who inspires you? Who do you relate to? Well, the result of this is that girls 
in the absence of female scientists, female scholars, well, they turn to male figures for intellectual and for scientific identification. Almost all the characters they associate with intelligence, with cleverness, and then with math and science are male characters. A few examples. Uh, these are Dr. House, in the, I'm sure you know the series, is a genius. Uh, if you're a manga reader, uh, these are two characters from extremely famous uh, uh, mangas. One is L in Death Note. Girls know, th know him, love him, say he's so clever and logical. And this is Dr. Stone in the manga, uh, Senku in the manga Dr. Stone. He's the perfect scientific mind. These are the three um, fictional characters that came back most in the, in the girls' examples. Cleverness, logical thinking, scientific thinking, the closest thing to uh, a model in fiction when it comes to mathematics for them. In contrast, they had a really hard time finding the equivalent with a female representation of intelligence, cleverness, or, mathemati or um, a female mathematician. And this is no surprise because uh, in fiction too, men and women are really far from equal when it comes to mathematics and they are far from being treated equally. So, yes, there are not that many fictional mathematicians, that many movies or series made about uh, math people, but still we can find a few. And what we can find in these um, books, films, TV series is a very unequal treatment of women in math. So, to, to modelize what goes on and um, the most um, situations that come back and back. Uh, I gave a few examples from movies, but this is also true of books and TV series. But on the one hand, you have male mathematicians in fiction, and they tend to have a gift of their own. They have some kind of genius or talent. It came from them, and they are the first one who, who have this uh, gift or talent. On the other hand, women, um, fictional mathematicians who are women, tend to inherit the gift from a father uh, or from an uncle or from a grandfather, usually male figures. Male, uh, male mathematicians tend to be the main characters or the leaders. Female mathematicians are more often a secondary or a, a background character. The first one are geniuses, the second one are mostly hard workers. They make a lot of effort. The first one makes central mathematical uh, contributions. Uh, the women tend to make more uh, discrete or even uh, invisible mathematical contribution in the story. That's a negative trait, but men, uh, male mathematicians in fictions tend to be rather obsessive, asocial, they lack social skills. This is a trait that is way less present in women who tend to be rather courageous, stu stubborn, but also with some kind of social skills and sometimes they even help other male mathematicians to gain more skills. They tend to be in a dominant position where she tends to be in a subordinate position. What's more, male mathematicians have way more happy endings. They find love, they find success, they find fame or money, sometimes thanks to their mathematical talent. This is m not the case for women who tend to have a tragic ending. And the lesson here is that if you try and pursue mathematics, something's going to go wrong. That what that what happens in Agora, so the, the fictional uh, telling of the the history of uh, um, uh, Hypatia. She, she dies. She's stoned at the end. I don't know if you've seen the movie Gifted, but it's the story of a girl who has an incredible gift in mathematics, like her mother who committed suicide, like her grandmother who is completely bonkers, and in the end she becomes happy because she stops doing math. <laughs> That's a happy ending, but well. Uh, so, the message that, that is uh, brought out by these movies is that it's always risky and there is a chance of not being happy if you are a woman who pursue mathematics. It's kind of like a social sanction not to do it. So, <laughs> girls don't really know those characters, don't really identify with them. 
But what they find in TV series, in films, in books, are other female characters whom they identify with. But the female characters that they like, their preferred heroines, are very different and they are liked for very different reasons than the, than the male characters. So some of them, you know, so I, I hope as well, they tend to be strong, they tend to be serious, and they tend to be kind. So uh, I'm sure you know Hermione from the, the um, uh, Harry Potter series, books and, uh, and, and, uh, and movies. You could describe Hermione as an in incredibly clever or brilliant person. That's not really the way girls remember her or describe her. She is described as rigorous, serious, hardworking, never as completely brilliant. And that's the way she is portrayed, isn't she? Uh, another, f an, another favorite is uh, Sophie from um, Hall's Moving Castle, who's been, who's been described as very brave, courageous, fighting for her and her loved one. Uh, another one is Jane from the series Jane the Virgin, who's really kind. Um, and she gives all of herself to her family, to her son, and to everyone around her. So we've got these female role models that are really models of strength. They are not, um, they don't have, their, they don't really doubt their strength. So it's not that women are feeble or, you know, or, in, or weak in any way. They are strong. They are very strong characters, but they are strong in their kindness, in their caring for others, and not really in their intelligence or in their mental capacities. So it's a very different portrait than the, the guys we have. They are inspiring for girls because they also have the capacity to resist in front of violence, in front of difficulties. And um, they go through painful ordeals, they go through difficulties, but they come back. They are resilient, but they don't become vengeful, they don't become angry. They just take it upon themselves and they carry on. And um, this is a very, I think, powerful quote from uh, Gail, who said that she loves Sophie from Howl's Moving Castle because, well, she picks herself up. She was cursed, but who cares? Because in the end, she meets Haru, um, the super strong musician. And another, I think, very moving thing that uh, Gail said and other girls said the same is that she likes that characters like Mulan, characters like Merida from Disney movies, they could fight when she was not able to. So you've got strong women, women who pick up arms, who carry a sword, who carry a bow. And she loves them because she says that, well, they are the warriors that she couldn't be. They fight to exist um, and they fight to live the life they want to and uh, they, they give her hope. So you've got, and this was a recurring thing, these warriors, strong, important female characters. And I wanted to end with the fact that they are really double-edged heroines because yes, they are strong, yes, they fight, but they never completely uh, go against what hurt them the most. And these are the gender roles that they still have to respect and the norms that they still have to respect. And if you issue with you, uh, issues with those strong uh, females and warriors that we have in fiction that girls love, First one is that um, they kind of give the message that you have to be a tomboy if you want to be a successful girl. So sometimes in order to be strong, in order to be a better woman, then you have to abandon some traits that are deemed feminine and kind of imitate the masculine. Another limit is that just as the science uh, superstar that are presented very often, they are always exceptional and incredible and super strong and, and, and the best at what they do, like maybe you recognized Buffy here and Katniss from the Hunger Games. And the last problem with them is that they teach girls to be resilient, that is to take upon themselves hurt after hurt and to never to pick up arms but you never go and destroy the cause of the problem and the cause of the hurt, which is inequality, patriarchal thinking, and the gender norms that are still constraining them. And so this brings me to, to this conclusion about uh, gender, um, gender inequalities in science and role models. We don't have enough of them right now to inspire girls, but we should be careful what we provide, what kind of models we provide for them, and to do better, we need more diverse models. Catherine gave a few ideas also what to, could, 
could be a few and a good um, models for girls in science and math, but we also need them to really challenge the gender norms more deeply and more completely. And this way, I think, is the only way to change what I try to show, which is the lack of female role models for thinking, for creating things with your mind, and for being deeply brilliant and intelligent. Thank you.